Good afternoon. Today I want to focus on an issue that's been talked about a lot over the past several months and one that I, I've said needs to be a priority uh, for the last five years, and that's housing. As you might remember, in my first year in office, I worked with the legislature to pass a $37 million housing bond, which leveraged another $198 million in additional resources, making it the single largest investment in state history at that time in housing. But even then, we knew there was more work to do. That's why after the American Rescue Plan was passed last year, I made it clear to the legislature that housing needs to be on the top of our list of priorities. Fortunately, at that time, they agreed and funded a portion of my request last year. But it's important to get the rest of it, to put it to work as soon as possible. So I asked for the balance, which is uh, 145 million more this session. This would bring our total investment over the last two years to about 250 million. Mr. Hanford will go into further detail in a few minutes, but our proposals are focused on housing for working families and Vermonters, including a creative new approach to fill what I call the missing middle. Because the fact is, Housing that middle-income families can afford is practically non-existent. And this is incredibly important to remember. And it's money we actually needed yesterday, which is why I asked that 70 million of this year's money be put in budget adjustment so it could be immediately dispersed. Unfortunately, uh, due to politics, that didn't happen and the legislature moved the housing uh, dollars into two separate bills, and they're on a slow path to the finish line and won't get passed anytime soon. Even more concerning is it looks like they're putting policies into those housing bills that I previously vetoed. Two new government registries that I believe would reduce housing stock and also reduce the number of smaller home improvement contractors. Now, as I said, most legislators, including legislative leaders, have said they agree housing is a priority and a goal we all share. So now is the time for them to prove it and remove the poison pills they combined with the housing dollars they know I care deeply about and we desperately need. If this is truly a shared priority, let's work together to get it done because Vermonters can't afford the political games when it comes to this issue in particular. If you read my veto letters on the two bills I return, you'll see I offered a clear path forward on both of them. So again, if we all agree that major investments in housing are needed, let's pass a bill that includes the areas we agree on quickly so we can begin the work we need to do to make a real difference in Vermonters' lives uh, as well as to grow the economy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Hanford. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. I'd like everyone listening and watching to take a second and think about your housing situation. Maybe you're lucky and you can afford a home in your ideal community. Perhaps you're someone who's enjoying the rapid appreciation of your home's value. However, that's not the case for far too many Vermonters. I bet if you asked 10 Vermonters about housing in the state, nine could tell you about a family member, a friend, a coworker that is struggling to find an apartment to rent or a home to pr uh, purchase in their price range. The data doesn't lie. We have a housing availability and affordability problem in Vermont. The solution to the problem is clear. Build more housing, Fix the housing we have, and don't leave any vulnerable neighbors behind. Fortunately, thanks to billions in federal aid and strong state revenues, we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make a real difference. We have a chance to invest in our communities and correct the underinvestment in housing. The governor proposed a comprehensive strategic housing investment plan using $250 million of the federal funds from the American Rescue Plan Act. Unfortunately, three main parts of this plan have yet to be acted on by the legislature. 
we must reinvest and revitalize our currently underutilized housing stock. We know opportunities exist in our historic neighborhoods to provide the affordable housing we need by improving existing buildings through programs like the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, or VHIP. Over 650 units have been brought forward by dozens of property owners across the state wanting to participate in this program, but the additional funding that the governor has called for, going all the way back to last November, was stripped from the budget and attached to other policy bills that need more time and more discussion. We must also support reinvestment in our manufactured housing communities, resulting in healthier, more climate resilient homes for the historically underserved population in Vermont. Again, the funding to address this non-controversial shared priority has been slowed by an unrelated controversial policy discussion in the legislature. It's important for people needing homes and living in these communities to know we currently have over 350 vacant mobile home lots that could be prepped and ready to receive energy efficient homes with this funding. We must also assist families whose incomes are just above the affordable housing income limits, but are being priced out of the housing market, the missing middle housing gap. A day doesn't go by without me hearing of the struggles of a teacher, a nurse, a skilled trade worker, or a child care provider unable to find a home they can afford to buy. These are essential members of our communities, filling essential jobs with nowhere to live. Without new programs to address the crisis and encourage the building of more modest homes, Vermont's affordability and equity gap will only continue to grow. These proposed solutions have long been identified, the programs work, and we have wide support. Yet these tangible proposals that can make an immediate impact this construction season are being mired in legislative policy bills. Let's continue to have those important and needed policy conversations but we must move forward with what we agree on and allocate the federal funding to make it happen as soon as possible. I want to say one more time, we all agree there's a crisis. We have the money to confront it. We have an agreement that the programs make an immediate impact now, while also setting the table for transform transformational change needed to address housing growth in the future. Our friends and family members, neighbors, and communities are working to recover two years after dealing with the pandemic. Let's use the federal recovery dollars as they were intended to help Vermonters and deliver the additional housing capacity they need. To make the most of this moment, we must be more deliberate and we must act faster. Vermonters are calling for more action and more help in this very real housing crisis. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Last week, I spoke about changes to our testing program. You can now make an appointment to pick up a rapid take-home test at many, many sites around the state. Remember, as we are faced with a highly transmissible variant of the virus, getting that rapid result is critical to taking quick action if you do test positive. At this time, PCR testing, though, is still available for those who need it. Testing is available to all, but while virus transmission has decreased, we recommend testing be focused on those specific situations where your risk is the highest. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, or if you are a close contact and not vaccinated or not up to date on your vaccines. Now today I wanna to talk about another transition, this time related to vaccine clinics. As you know, Vermont has had a very robust program of offering vaccines around the state, thanks to so many partners, including EMS, National Guard, healthcare professionals, community and equity partners, and more. Even after the initial vaccine rollout last spring, just last spring, hard to believe, began to slow down, we ramped up efforts again in the fall as boosters and vaccines for children became available. We offered regular standing clinics, clinics at schools, clinics at businesses, equity clinics, and brought the vaccine to people where they are, 
through barnstorming and special events. We've led the nation in vaccination rates, including for boosters and children vaccinated. This means the vast majority of Vermonters are highly protected from the most serious effects of COVID-19, our main goal in this pandemic. However, our extensive efforts also mean most people have had plenty of opportunity to be vaccinated and that the use of our statewide vaccine clinics at the present time is very low. This gives us the opportunity to make getting your COVID-19 vaccine more like other vaccines that you can get from your healthcare provider or pharmacy. The COVID-19 vaccines have already been available in those settings. In fact, primary care offices are the only place we're actually seeing a small increase in doses administered. As I've spoken about many times here before, healthcare providers play a crucial role in being a trusted resource for patients who may have questions or just need reassurance from a medical professional. We're still awaiting more information on approval of a vaccine for the youngest Vermonters, children six months to four years of age. But I do want parents and caregivers to know that when a vaccine is determined to be safe and effective for use, their child will also be vaccinated through their pediatrician or family practitioner. This means when the time comes, you will make an appointment through your clinician's office rather than through the health department registration system. I would like to thank all of our healthcare partners for their work to have these vaccines available for patients when they're ready to get vaccinated or boosted. For those who do not have a primary care clinician and for special populations, we will continue to fill any gaps and work to ensure equitable access to vaccines through small community clinics. And as with everything in this changing pandemic, if circumstances change, we remain prepared to ramp up vaccination efforts if needed. And of course, we're going to continue to promote vaccination and support our healthcare partners in this process. <clears throat> now moving on, we also continue to monitor any developments concerning the BA2 subvariant of Omicron, both abroad and here in Vermont, through genetic sequencing and wastewater surveillance. Unfortunately, we cannot predict exactly how it will affect us yet. You already know that BA2 is a more contagious version of Omicron, and we may indeed see an uptick in cases, much like Europe has. However, let me emphasize, it is uncertain at this time if the U.S. will see a slight surge in cases or just what I've been calling a prolonged tail to the epidemic curve of Omicron. So far, that is exactly what we've been seeing in Vermont, though it is still early. But like the original Omicron variant, BA2 causes less severe illness in most people, so rather than overall case counts, Hospitalizations will be a more meaningful measure of the impact here in Vermont. And it has not impacted hospitalization at this time. While it shouldn't cause an increase in the rate of hospitalization, because it's a more transmissible virus, there could be more infections and consequently an increase in the absolute number of hospitalizations. We'll continue to watch that and remain prepared. We have plenty of testing and we have access to treatment for those at highest risk. All the early data shows vaccines may protect us from serious outcomes as well as they did against the first Omicron wave. So the best and most important way to be prepared is to make sure you are up to date on your COVID-19 vaccines. That means anyone age five or older has their two shots and anyone age 12 and older gets their booster. I wanna dwell on this for one second because I hope that Vermonters 65 and older especially will hear and heed this message since they do face greater risk from this virus. According to our dashboard, the percentage of 65 to 69 year olds who are up to date is 79%. For 70 to 74 year olds, 
and for 75 and older, 84%. Now these percentages are very high, highest in the country, but when it comes to getting that booster shot, they need to be even higher. It's just not worth taking the chance of getting really sick. Please don't risk it. Just take those easy steps to be up to date on your vaccinations. So whether it's at your doctor's office, at a pharmacy, or at one of the many clinics that we still have scheduled through the month of April, find a booster shot for you or a loved one if they still need it. Visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, what do you make of the auditor's report <clears throat> about the overpayment of some health care providers? Well, you know, we'll, we'll see. I haven't looked at the report in depth, but... Uh, but obviously, uh, we were working uh, in the initial phases of the pandemic to make sure that we were protecting Vermonters and make sure that we had enough resources uh, available to keep uh, hospitals and, and providers uh, afloat. So I think we made the best decisions possible at that point in time. I look forward to, to going through uh, the report, and I know our team will go through that. And, and see if there's any uh, deficiencies. But at the end of the day, I think we made the right decisions. On a lighter note, how's your road? Our road is, uh, is fine, um, which is surprising. I mean, I, I saw uh, on some of the news reports uh, where they're, uh, they're impacted more in areas like, um, I know up in the Middlesex area, Portal Road uh, has uh, quite, it was challenged uh, in Roxbury as well, and in in across the state in different different places. But but ours, and we've been, you know, in years past, uh, it's difficult to get through uh, during mud season. Uh, but this year, for some reason, uh, they've been upgrading some, and it just hasn't impacted our road hardly at all. I mean, it's it's muddy, but but not that bad. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Levine, I just had a question for you. Um, if we could get you over here in front of the microphone. Sure. Bob's new here, um, so that's what we usually do. Bob. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> I appreciate it. I was going to walk slowly. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, there are going to be some people listening to you talking about the BA2 variant who are going to be thinking, uh-oh, here we go again. Uh, could you put it in perspective for us? Absolutely. So, as you know, the United States is usually later in the game as the virus travels across the planet. So we have experience from countries like China, um, cities like Hong Kong, where they've had pretty much a zero COVID policy and um, approach the virus very differently, and their population has a very, very low rate of uh, previous infection. So we're seeing outbreaks occurring in those places at sometimes very extraordinary numbers. Then we have Europe, which I'll sort of divide into sort of the mainland continent, especially the Scandinavian countries, where we're seeing a lot of cases, but not a lot of serious outcomes. The UK, sort of uniquely, is seeing a lot of cases, another surge, if you will, uh, also with more hospitalizations. But most of the rest of that area has not been seeing the same increase in hospitalizations. Then we come to the United States, where the Northeast and the West seem to have the earliest signs of more concentrations of the BA2. And what's happening here is we're seeing it as a higher percentage of the whole genome sequencing that's being done. So literally an hour or two before this meeting, the CDC came out with this week's um, estimates around the country using data from previous weeks. And New England is now 55% BA2. Last week it was about 38%. Week before it was way below 20. So it's certainly exhibiting a doubling rate, if you will, like you would expect a highly transmissible variant 
and it is 1.4 to 1.6 times more transmissible than the original Omicron. So we're seeing that at the same time that cases continue to either go down or plateau in these regions. So even though it's a higher percentage of what they're sequencing, it's not like it's taken off into a whole surge at this point in time. But that's why I tell people to exercise caution because we're early in that game and we need to see how it plays out over these next several weeks. But right now, I'm certainly not saying there's a need for panic, a need for concern about, oh, I've seen this movie before and it's happening right before my eyes again, because it may not be. Uh, we may have in the United States enough people who've actually gotten vaccinated and or gotten Omicron that this impact won't be felt as significantly. You also mentioned the importance of older people, people over 65 being fully vaccinating and had, having the booster. What about a fourth shot? Uh, there's a lot of talk about it, there's time for folks to be considering a fourth shot. Where does that stand? In this country, it stands here. Number one, Moderna and Pfizer have both submitted data to the FDA that they think supports using a fourth shot. Much of their data is coming from some Israeli studies and from one CDC study that showed a slight decrease in uh, prevention of serious outcomes in the Omicron era. But it wasn't a huge drop, I keep that in mind. Uh, most people who are considered vaccine experts in the country are saying, we don't need to rush to a fourth shot right now. We should evaluate this data that's been submitted we should give it a fair hearing. The advisory panel to the FDA will look at it and make a recommendation, which is probably weeks away. Uh, and then if needed, the CDC's advisory panel will do the same thing. But right now, uh, no one is saying a fourth shot is what's needed to do anything at this point. And more people are talking about just having an annual booster shot like you would for the flu. ask about the, the housing uh, proposal, maybe I can get Commissioner Hanford's um, opinion in, on this, but you, you referenced, and I believe it's the contractor registry bill that it's attached to, right? It's, there's two bills, and it, we're just, one of them has uh, passed out of the Senate, is over in the House, and that has the contractor registry. The other bill um, we're hearing could have the rental registry on it, so those are the two bills. Refer to those and as I veto both of them. Yes. You refer, refer to those as the, the poison pill. Should the, the legislature move forward with these two separate proposals, even though they have the missing middle money? I mean, what would you veto that? Well, again, I think I've made it very clear um, that I don't uh, like the contractor registry. Uh, I think it's harmful uh, to con uh, contractors and to the overall supply of, of uh, homes and so forth. I feel the same way about the rental registry. And in my veto letters, I laid out a clear path forward. Here are the conditions, just like I did with the gun bill. You know, I laid out the position that I have, and here's what you can do if you want to pass this. So I laid that out. Um, so they have the ability to fix those two bills uh, to get them to the uh, point where I would accept them. Otherwise, they have another path, and that's to override. I mean, they've overridden other uh, bills I vetoed. So they have the numbers. They can do that. They don't have to mix the two in order to play the political game, as, as I see it, uh, to get those passed. They can take the other approach. I mean, you know, work with me on getting to where I, th I think it needs to go to get my acceptance and approval or uh, override it. Those are the two paths. They don't have to play the games. I guess in my discussion with lawmakers on both of those bills, they kind of see it in the opposite direction. They I, think I, can, that, I can imagine. Right. Yeah, that, that they believe it'll help create housing and um, create more opportunities for renters. So I guess, yeah. How well, again, we you know, you think about I, I think about the small mom and pops, uh, and, and it's the same with the small, small mom and pop contractors as well. Th those are the people it's going to hurt. It's not going to hurt the large uh, uh, contractors. It's not going to hurt uh, those who have uh, rental, uh, rentals for business. That's not going to impact them, but, but it is going to harm the smaller, again, 
take the, the contractors in particular, the small uh, one or two person crews. Uh, we're just adding another level of government bureaucracy on them, another insurance policy they have to have, um, and uh, all kinds of conditions uh, that they have to follow. And pretty soon they're just going to say, look, I'm not interested in doing your porch. I'm not interested in doing your, your kitchen renovation. I'm not interested in doing that. I'm just going to go work for somebody else. It's a lot easier. And those bigger contractors, especially with all the money we have flowing right now, they're not interested in doing your porch or doing your roof or painting your house or doing the renovation inside your kitchen. They're not going to do it. So we're going to have a void there. And uh, so that's the, the contract part. The other part is all the folks, we know we pay an enormous amount of money in the state for property taxes. I mean, that's, that's not a secret here in Vermont. Um, so some people, when they uh, feel that they, they need to supplement uh, their income, so they rent out a portion of their home or, or they rent out their home for maybe the winter if they, they weather in Florida after retirement uh, before they come back. And this, again, it precludes them because of the, the regulation that comes along with it. And, and I, I think at some point they just say, it's not worth the bother. I'm just not going to do it. So I think it does impact both the housing stock and the available uh, labor in order to, to do everything that we need to have done. It doesn't take long. I mean, think about, I think initially it was 2,500 uh, was the, the level uh, for the contractors. It may have been bumped up, but, but that's, you know, that's a day's worth of work because that includes materials. That's not just, that's just not labor. That's, and, and equipment, that's, that's materials. So it doesn't take long these days uh, to get over that threshold. Bob, I just wanted to go back as well when you asked Dr. Levine the question. I just want, I want to make sure from the very beginning, uh, we, we keep track of hospitalizations, right? So when you're talking about this next variant, uh, we are obviously watching the hospitalizations and we haven't seen uh, that it's increased uh, dramatically. And, um, and as well, we've seen over the last few weeks where half of those who are hospitalized uh, are there um, for something else, and they just found out that they have COVID. Uh, so again, we're not seeing anything that gives us uh, great concern at this point in time. Speaking about bills that you're not fond of, how about the clean heat standard? Could you see yourself signing that bill? Um, the clean heat standard, um, it would depend on how they move forward. Uh, as I've said, uh, this is the one that they're uh, putting, uh, is being transferred for the tough work to be done by the PUC, right? The Public Utility Commission. Um, so they're, they're, from my standpoint, advocating their position, their authority, and letting someone else do the dirty work, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and from that standpoint, that's my problem. Like, if that were to just come back to the legislature um, for an up or down vote after they get done their work, um, then I could see myself making something work. Um, but, uh, but if they're just going to, again, they're, just, they're not just abdicating their authority, they're abdicating mine as well. Uh, because I get one vote. Uh, in the end on um, these bills. And, uh, and if this impacts, uh, has a dramatic effect on Vermonters and their livelihood, then I would have no reason to support them. But not knowing what they're going to do in the PUC process, I just can't make that judgment beforehand. So I think they should have that come back. If they were to add that, then maybe we can make that work. Governor, uh, Sam Israel here with Local 22 News. Um, with Canada like e slightly easing restrictions with you know not no longer requiring COVID tests, um, how do you believe that can affect I guess the Vermont economy and businesses? Well, I think in, in some respects we're seeing you know the economy is rebounding. I think people are getting back more accustomed to uh, taking care of themselves. Uh, we've been through this for two years now. It's not new. Uh, and uh, they're uh, taking uh, this, um, this approach. Um, and, uh, and again, 
I, I think that it will help in some respects when you think about the number of travelers, tourists, and so forth that come into our state. Um, we'll, see, we'll see more activity. But again, the, as we've said, uh, the, the COVID's not gone, uh, it's subsided, uh, and there'll be this variant and new variants in the future, and we just have to learn how we deal with that, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we protect ourselves when we're, and others when we're sick uh, and test when necessary on our own. Dr. Levine, anything you want to add to that? Just an observation. <clears throat> I'm fond of trying to figure out who's doing what when I'm out in society. And my latest, um, this is very rough estimates uh, when I've been in the supermarket and other stores, is a quarter to a third of people still were wearing masks. Now, that's a minority by definition, but to me, that's a significant number of people. So I think people are using the guidance that we provided uh, appropriately and doing what they're comfortable with, if it's going without a mask or going with a mask, but they're out there, and that's the important thing. They're engaging in life. They're not staying home. Hey, Calvin, you'd asked that question before, and you said it was for both myself and, and Commissioner Hanford, but so I'll, I'll let Commissioner Hanford uh, weigh in as well. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, Calvin. You know, when I talk to, to folks out there that are looking for housing, whether it's rental or um, to purchase a home, the first thing they tell me is not that they're looking for two registries to help them find that home or, uh, you know, they want housing built. Um, they want to find a place to live in, in, that they can afford in their community. And um, that's what we're focused on. You know, it, it's getting uh, more choice for housing that really makes a difference for people, whether, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not safe or it's not available in their community. If they have choice of housing, a lot of these problems are solved. And that's what we're focused on like a laser is building more housing. The, the Fed this week is well announced that they're starting to tick up interest rates to try to cool down some of the demand. How do you see that playing out uh, with our housing market? Well, sure. There, um, interest rates uh, on mortgages uh, are, are starting to go up. Um, that's an added cost to, to Vermonters. Um, but right now, I think it's a lack of supply that most, most of the challenges um, that, that I hear, um, you know, financing that mortgage over 30 years, those interest rates certainly have an impact on their, their mortgage and their monthly payments. But when they can't find a home, it, it's hard to worry about that problem um, first. We, we need to, to build more homes and uh, something that folks can find. Um, last week, I asked you about the congressional loss of COVID funding, and you said you had kind of just heard about it from the White House call. Now that maybe you've had a little time to hear more, do you have a better understanding of how it's going to impact Vermont, and if there's anything yeah, that can kind of help with that? We're okay for right now, but, um, but I would say uh, I know that they're focused on this now, and every uh, response I've seen has been about the lack of the ability of the feds to continue. Uh, to provide testing and vaccines and so forth. So uh, I would say it's an issue uh, that is going to have an effect on us uh, possibly uh, down the road in the not too distant future. So I think that they should come together and provide more funding because as I've said, it's, it's not as though this is over. Um, we're going to see variants in the future and, and, and I know we have to transition to this endemic stage where just like the flu, we have to somewhat take care of ourselves. But there's still a role for the government to play. Um, but we do have, um, you know, it, over this period of time, uh, there is, uh, the pharmacies are, are playing a role, uh, the insurance companies are playing a role. So it's not as though the government has to provide it for in perpetuity, but there might be a transition period that needs to be, the tail needs to be a little bit longer. Um, my understanding is that uninsured people are going to be the most heavily affected by this and also that uninsured people are less likely to have like a primary care provider or a regular physician that they see. So are you concerned about this kind of loss of funding coinciding with these changes we're making to the vaccine clinics and testing centers? Yeah, again, I think we, we still have those in place and because it's subsided, uh, the, the, the pandemic has subsided. Uh, we're not seeing the need. Uh, thankfully, as well, in the state, we have a, 
a high percentage of, uh, of uh, those who have insurance. Um, we don't have as many that don't have insurance. Um, so I still believe that we can fulfill their need. Um, but, uh, but again, in the next few weeks, we, there needs to be a, maybe a, a point uh, to drop off a little bit more uh, easily than what is uh, was contemplated in Congress at this point in time. So I'm sure they'll work it out. Um, the, the, I think the administration, the Biden administration, is uh, seeing this as an issue, and, and they're fairly dogmatic, and, and I believe that they'll come to some reasonable conclusion. I mean, they still have, it's, it seems as though they, I mean, they still have the majority in the House, uh, in, in the House of Representatives, and um, at least uh, a one-person margin in the, uh, in the Senate. So it seems like they could get something done. This may be a better question for Dr. Levine or even Samuelson, if she's on the line, but uh, can you give us any numbers of how clinics would be affected? Like, is there going to be like a 50% drop in the number of clinics each week or going from 100 to 75, something that would kind of give us a scale, picture want, of the scale? Yeah, Secretary uh, Samuelson, did you hear the question, and are you on the line? I am on the line, but I'm having a difficult time hearing the question. This was about uh, the number of clinics uh, that are being dropped uh, over uh, the next month and so forth as we transition out of uh, testing and vaccine. Is that Was that the question, Erin? So, Governor, the only thing I have to, to add is exactly what you said. We're looking very closely at the numbers and the dis, uh, individuals who are getting tested and vaccinated. We're also looking at the availability of testing and vaccines in each community, really striving to ensure that individuals have the opportunity to get tested or vaccinated within a 30-minute drive of, of their home. Um, again, looking at uh, primary care clinics and federally qualified health centers and pharmacies really forming that backbone going forward. Thank you. Governor, uh, obviously not an issue just limited to Vermont. Like states across the nation have seen like obviously rising gas prices. You know, is there any message that you have to Vermonters dealing with the challenging, you know, increase in gas prices and anything that your, your administration is doing to try and uh, help Vermonters with yeah, this? Yeah, this, uh, this is, again, a national problem, a worldwide problem at this point. Um, gas prices affect, very regressive, uh, affect our state uh, dramatically because we're so rural. Uh, people have to travel long distance uh, in order to get to work. So, uh, as well, this has uh, a ratcheting effect inflationary uh, effect on everyday goods and services. So uh, it, it does impact all of us. Um, we, uh, we need to uh, do whatever we can. We're, we're trying to promote uh, um, public transportation as well for those who, who can. Uh, and uh, we would encourage anyone to carpool when they can as well. Uh, but this, again, is nothing that we can fix uh, on, the, on our level. I know some of uh, there's been a couple of states who have uh, eliminated their their gas tax, um, but it, you know, and we could do that here um, with the with the help of the legislature, but that's not a long-term solution, and it doesn't really, you know, we're talking about um, 28 cents, something of that. Uh, I think it's 28 cents. Um, that doesn't do it. I mean, that's that would be helpful, but it, that would preclude us from. Uh, leveraging, uh, using that money to leverage projects uh, as well in the future. So uh, we're going to need a national solution on this. Does that mean you, you don't want them? I mean, uh, you said it's uh, eliminating the gas tax is not a long-term solution, but is it a possible short-term solution? Well, I don't know as it would make that big a difference. You know, again, is 28 cents going to do it? Um, and, and it can't go for very long because we, we count on uh, that money uh, for our infrastructure or plowing, um, all our needs. So I don't know what we would backfill it with. We'd have to backfill it with something. Um, so it's not that it's off the table. It's just that uh, I don't see it as a long-term solution unless we 
find uh, money that we can backfill the transportation fund with. All right, we'll move to the phone, starting with Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, you mentioned $2,500 is uh, being a drop in the bucket for almost any construction process these days. Um, is there a threshold where you would think that you might consider signing for contractor registration? I mean, it would be $10,000 yeah. or something higher than that. I actually put that in the veto letter, and it was, uh, I believe, $10,000 was the, the what I had suggested. And, and that was... That would get me to a point where I would feel as though I would let it go through. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, we spoke in the fall at your conference um, about an evaluation of the cooling systems at all of the schools, which was about to be, be undertaken uh, so that you could see what will need to be done to make sure as, as uh, it gets warmer in the spring that schools will not be intolerable. Do you know where the progress is on, on that evaluation process? I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe maybe Secretary French is on the line and can answer that further, but it's it's more uh, not just AC, but it's HVAC, uh, the, everything. Uh, we need to make sure that we're moving air through the buildings. If we learn anything from, uh, from the pandemic is that uh, we need better circulating air in any infrastructure or any uh, projects of that nature in any congregate settings. So that's where we'd focus. Secretary French. Uh, yes, Governor. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, you know, the focus is really on indoor air quality, which is the intersection of a lot of policy work and the mitigation work. So, for example, we have, as you know, the initiative on PCB. Uh, testing and remediation, also radon testing. Both of those areas intersect with indoor air quality. Uh, there's been a lot of HVAC work uh, commissioned already as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so really what we're trying to new, do now is pull all these initiatives together and put them on a, a overarching project schedule for schools that's doable. Uh, it's going to take a couple of years for sure. Uh, we also have some assessment, not necessarily on cooling, but uh, we have a facilities inventory report that'll be coming in soon. And then there's a, a larger assessment scheduled under Act 72 of last year that needs to occur as well. Uh, so we'll be starting to get more information about schools, but not necessarily just focused on cooling. I totally understand. Uh, will that information be available to the public uh, when you when you make these first determinations? Yeah, sure. We have the uh, first draft of the inventory report I'm looking at this week. Uh, we'll be reporting that back to the General Assembly. The whole intention of that was to sort of set the groundwork for future policy deliberations. And similarly, with the larger assessment, those those tools will be used to formulate the policies on school construction and facilities improvement over time. Okay. Thank you both. I have no further questions. Thanks, as always. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so far as the housing crisis, I'm wondering if there's any area of Vermont that you're particularly concerned about than another, and I guess I'm thinking up here in the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, we suffer uh, from a housing crisis across the state, uh, but, you know, in particular, the Northeast Kingdom, um, but, but it, you know, it's really all sectors, uh, as uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, where uh, we are, uh, it seems like there is uh, a need for housing in every every sector. Mr. Hampert. Yep, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I would just add to that. Um, you know, th there's a housing crisis, you know, across the state, but but the needs are different and the solutions are different in different regions. Um, some parts of the state have housing stock. It's just unoccupied. It's tired. It needs reinvestment and. Uh, we have vacant units out there, believe it or not, uh, despite the, the housing shortage we have. And that's why programs like VHIP and others that reinvest in those properties, bring them back online, make them energy efficient, you know, address so many goals. It's smart growth, it's climate change, and it's investing in neighborhoods and improving the quality of life for everyone that, that lives near those homes that are brought back online. And, and, and some of those opportunities exist in some of our, our towns in the Northeast Kingdom and other parts of uh, Rutland and Bennington and Springfield. And so it's a, it's a diverse uh, set of needs and a diverse set of solutions, but every corner has a housing challenge. Okay, th thank you. 
Greg Sakenik, Bennington Banner. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor. Um, in the issue related to housing is um, the uh, general assistance program um, and whether there's a way to uh, avoid to put more money forward to um, construct some um, housing that would eliminate the need for, for some folks to, to have to participate in the general assistance program on a regular basis. Uh, is, uh, is that part of your proposal? And uh, is, is, that, is that money also in there? Or is that in, can you sort of bring us up to speed on where that is? Because yeah. I know that was part yeah. of the Budget Adjustment Act. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll let Commissioner Hanford uh, come up and explain what we've done thus far and what we intend to do. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, uh, our goal was uh, to take care of those uh, who need it most. We wanted to make sure that people could transition uh, from, uh, you know, uh, one-time uh, housing needs uh, to something more permanent. Uh, temporary housing wasn't the answer, isn't the answer uh, for that population. We want them to have something they can count on. Uh, so we focused on that early on. Uh, but uh, Commissioner Hanford can explain further. Yeah, great question. Um, this is this is a, a bright spot, really, um, where we have invested a lot of funding and we have um, re reached ag agreement with the legislature and a lot of housing partners. You know, last year there was about 150 million dollars put towards affordable housing development, largely to rehouse folks exiting homelessness. Um, and this year, there's already been 50 million approved uh, for that same effort with, with another 50 sort of in, in the hopper. So out of the 250 million that the governor put forward, uh, about 200 of that has been put towards uh, affordable housing, stressing the need for folks, uh, the most vulnerable folks um, exiting homelessness in recovery, and we're making uh, progress there. Over 800 units have already been built. Another 800 are already in construction and about half of those are serving folks exiting homelessness. Um, and, and the latest numbers, and, and these are a few months old, but we've been successful in, in exiting about 1,300 families from homelessness into permanent housing. Thank you. Um, one more question, Governor, also a housing-related question, but a slightly different. I'm wondering if you've heard anything more uh, from our federal partners about the possibility of refugees from Ukraine coming to the United States, and you had mentioned earlier that you would welcome them to Vermont. Uh, I was wondering if there's anything to update uh, folks with on that front. Yeah, nothing uh, to update at this point in time. It takes, um, it takes a while uh, to get through the process. Uh, that's what we're hearing. Uh, it won't be, from their perspective, it won't be anytime soon, but the offer still stands. Um, obviously, we're still focused as well on the Afghan refugees. Uh, and we're trying to accommodate as many as possible uh, in that regard. But, but again, if, uh, if, this, if there's a, an opportunity uh, for us to take in Ukrainian um, refugees, we'll, we'll do so as well. Right. Thank you very much, Governor. Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll try Tim McQuisden, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, you mentioned the larger contractors, and one of the, the bigger issues with contractors and developers is Act 250, and I'm wondering what your take is on how the legislature is proceeding with Act 250 changes. Not quick enough. I, I see you smiling. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this has been, I, I, we've been asking um, for modernization of Act 250 for quite a number of years, and we haven't seen a whole lot of improvement in that area. And we still, um, I'm concerned about some of the activities or lack of activities in the legislature at this point in time. So there's still uh, time to rebound and get something accomplished, but uh, but it's it's a perennial issue at this point. It's, it's over 50 years old, and, and we need to modernize in order to, uh, to make some is make it more seamless, more efficient, uh, and protect uh, our environment, protect from uh, overdevelopment. But we really need, really need some relief right now. Uh, we need it for uh, all the, the money we have coming forward, and ARPA, and homes, and 
developments and so forth. So uh, the time to act is now. Mr. Hanford, anything you want to add to that? I, I just add real quickly that you, there seems to be some, um, you know, common uh, understanding that Act 250 relief in areas that are already developed, already have the infrastructure, is a great place to build more homes. Um, but we haven't got that relief yet, and, and I, I really hope that a compromise is reached because uh, it, it seems to work it towards all the goals we have without uh, removal of those barriers in the smart growth housing locations. Sometimes people are building farther out a field where it has the opposite um, effect, and, and, and I would think that we could come to a compromise and really support the housing that's needed in the places that already have adequate infrastructure and support and, and all agree on that and move that forward. Is there, uh, Commissioner, is there, is there um, any movement right now on uh, reaching such a compromise? There, there's some uh, movement afoot in, in one of the, the housing bills. There is some smart growth uh, land use reform that involves Act 250 and other local zoning that moves this forward. Um, and yet that's another sort of reason why, uh, um, uh, you know, moving that bill forward, getting the funding for housing and getting some of the barriers removed for smart growth lo housing locations is something we all hear, everyone agrees on and, and why we need to move those forward without the other uh, debates that are slowing it up. All right, great, thank you very much. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm curious if there's a date certain set for when the last state-run vaccination clinic will be held and um, when you anticipate winding down the uh, the registration portal. Is that uh, Secretary Samuelson or Secretary Samuelson, did you hear the question? Is that something you could answer? <laughs> yeah. We don't have a specific date certain of when the last clinic will be. Um, again, I, I think it's a misnomer to think that it's that it is a last clinic. Many of our healthcare providers, um, particularly our pharmacies and others, will continue. Um, but the last uh, sponsored clinic by the state is likely to come sometime in a in mid April. And. Um I know previously uh, Dr. Levine and um, former Secretary Smith uh, held targeted uh, sessions um, in different parts of the state. There was some, some direct response to conditions on the ground, you know, to try to encourage vaccination, things like that. Is there anything of that ilk still going on? Or are you guys still looking at corners of the state that, that need um, a, a boost? Or is that winding down as well? Maybe uh, Commissioner Levine. That is <clears throat> that has wound down as well. Uh, we've noticed um, just uh, markedly diminished numbers of people getting needles and arms at many of these efforts, um, <clears throat> which isn't anything against people who aren't coming to get vaccinated. It's more a testimony to how many people have been vaccinated thus far. So. Uh, there's a little bit less need for that. Um, again, this is not the final word. Should there be some unforeseen circumstance that develops with the virus, which won't be just here in Vermont, it'll be all across the country, I'm sure, if that should happen, uh, we're poised to stand things up again. Um, if you know a major effort's needed because there is a new mRNA vaccine, because there's a new strain and one had to be developed to take care of that strain, uh, there'll be a very large vaccination effort that will be going on, and that would be a potential scenario that we could uh, redevelop again what we've already had here. Just like we've been saying, you know, the National Guard has taken down search sites. Um, it doesn't mean that they've destroyed everything that they had. It's all waiting again, so if someday it would be necessary, they'd be able to do that again. Uh, so we have a lot of experience and are able to do that, but there's just no need for that at this point in time during the, this part of the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, and finally, for uh, Secretary French, um, it's been uh, 
just over a week since uh, the the shift to optional masking at schools as the recommendation, um, and some areas uh, jumped a week early. Just curious if uh, at the state level you're hearing any reports on um, on how that is going, how that went, and um, if any schools and districts are, are seeing more cases than they thought they would. Yeah, thanks. I don't, I don't think we're seeing any large pattern and change. Um, I do have my uh, regular meeting with the leadership of the School Nurses Association on Thursday. I found that to be a very useful forum for me to sort of monitor the temperature on things. So, uh, so far, so good. I think schools are, uh, what I'm hearing, welcoming the change. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, taking advantage of that opportunity to, to focus in on uh, getting back to normal as much as they can. Okay. Thank you very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Governor, have you had an opportunity since last Tuesday to study up on H606? which would prohibit development on 50% of all of Vermont land area? And if so, what do you think about it, especially as with regard to housing and private property rights? Yeah, you're, you're referring to the 30 by 30, right? Or 50 by 50, yeah. either one, yeah. I, I think the, the 30 by 30, I, I don't see as being problematic. Uh, I think we're almost there, uh, actually, in the higher 20% range. Um, I'm a little concerned about the the 50 by 50. Uh, that's going to be much more difficult to uh, attain. So, uh, again, we'll see how it works its way through the legislature at this point. But um, but the 30 by 30 isn't as problematic as the 50 by 50. Thank you. Governor S4, the replacement for the S30 gun control bill, which you vetoed, was approved in a week by the House and the Senate. Senator Benning and others say that it ignores due process rights against seizure of private property. Are you considering vetoing S4? No, I, I laid that out in my veto message, uh, deal to deal. I said that um, if they change uh, these provisions, went from 30 days, uh, which is what they wanted, uh, to uh, or an additional 27 days, uh, to what I suggested, an additional four days. Uh, that I would let the bill go through. So um, I'm going to, uh, if, if nothing else has changed and they followed the veto letter, uh, then I will let that go. Thank I, you. I, I don't know. Um, again, I, I, that, was, that was the first I'd heard um, in terms of Senator Benning's argument on that issue, um, what I had understood. Uh, my interactions with legislators initially uh, was it was the waiting period that was the problem. So I, I didn't hear about the other issue. That's something that's being done as we speak, um, and it just codifies uh, what, uh, what has become practice. So, again, I, I was not aware of the, the problem that Senator Benning had brought up when I conferred with uh, legislators initially. In fact, uh, the one of the uh, legislators, uh, Representative Brennan, had uh, had offered 15 days um, and uh, 15 business days at that, and uh, he thought he had a deal on that with S30, and they uh, they turned that down. So um, my thought was I thought that was excessive, uh, so that's why I went in with an extra four days, and uh, thought that that made sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. I had a couple of healthcare questions for you, Governor. First, um, I'm sure you saw the news that um, three of the state's largest hospitals are asking for a pretty sizable rate increase in what they're charging commercial insurers. Um, and some of the state's insurance companies are pushing back, saying that their policyholders just can't afford it. I'm curious, I know that this isn't really a decision for you, but I'm wondering if you're keeping tabs on this and whether you have any thoughts on whether whether policyholders can afford more, whether Vermonters can afford to pay higher health care costs. Yeah, again, I'm always uh, concerned with the cost of living, uh, especially here in Vermont. And uh, this, again, is a reflection 
of, uh, of the inflation that we're seeing, higher, higher wages, uh, higher prices for uh, goods and services, and uh, it's across the board. Uh, so while I'm not surprised, it is a problem on uh, very regressive on some of those who are, uh, can uh, not afford it um, and they're are, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. So, so again, um, this is just a, another uh, effect of, uh, of uh, inflation uh, that, that I said was my biggest concern about three months ago and it's holding true today. The other question I had for you was back to the state auditor's report. I know it sounds like you still have to go through it and, and vet the methodology here, but if it does prove to be true that the state overpaid at least $7 million through the health care stabilization grant program, do you think that that money should be given back? Well, again, nobody has asked for it yet, as far as I'm aware. I don't think the federal government has uh, identified this. This is the auditor's opinion. I might ask Secretary Samuelson. I know she's been through the report, whether she has anything to offer. Yeah, thank you, Governor, and thank you for the, the question. So we have had an opportunity to go through the auditor's report. I think it's important to remember the context of when uh, these payments were made. Um, it was We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have treatments. Um, people were scared, and our providers were really um, the ones who were coming to the table. Um, during, the, during that time, we also know that our health care providers' revenues were down um, significantly. Um, and this program was successful in helping to stabilize the providers at that point in time. We know that the program was implemented very quickly, as the auditor pointed out, in order to be responsive to the needs of our health care providers and the needs of, of that, that really unprecedented moment in time. That said, we've always planned and have already begun, even before the auditor's report, to do a post-payment review of the providers. Um, we have started that process. It's been underway for quite some time now. And each of the providers that we have reviewed have been able to um, present appropriate costs that represent the amount that they were paid. And so we are not seeing any fraudulent behavior um, you know, in any of the of the reviews that we've done, and ten of the reviews that we have um, have been across the provi the seventeen providers that the auditor um, reviewed. So, again, there's no fraudulent behavior. Um, they're able to present and produce costs uh, that are appropriate, um, and we really do feel like this program overall has been a success um, in stabilizing our healthcare system. It sounds like the answer is no, that there is no intention of asking anyone to pay pay the overpayments back. If if we had if we identify a, a place in which the the funds um, don't meet the federal requirements, and as of yet we have not identified anyone, um, then we would look to work with the agency of administration or, if appropriate, the federal government to recoup. But as of now, there's no evidence that that there's a necessary recruitment. Thanks. Well, that's it. Thank you all very much for coming in, and we'll see you again next week. No, we had one that was 48 minutes a couple weeks ago. <laughs> but that's close. That, was, that one was...